Hey everyone, this is the Quad Peak here. You know that without catalysts, the amount of energy your body would need would cause it to burn up? But how do they reduce the amount of energy you need by so much? Let's go ahead and take a look. Consider this. You're in your chemistry class and you don't understand how to do a chemistry problem. You look around for help and see that your chem teacher is in a good mood. After getting help, you're able to finish the problem successfully. Catalysts work the same way. Take pepsin for example. No, it's not Pepsi. Pepsin is a common catalyst that helps speed up and simplify peptide synthesis. But what is peptide synthesis? Here's a hint. It's in the name. Peptide bonds, as you may have learned in biology class, are essentially what connect the amino acids that make up the proteins in your body. On the other hand, synthesis is the production of chemical compounds. So together, peptide synthesis is the production or creation of peptide bonds. However, these processes are complex and require help for completion. To distinguish these catalysts, scientists have given them special names. They're called enzymes. Sorry, that was my neighbor's cat. It loves catalysts. Hey, get off my lawn. It's a green screen, old man. Oh. Look around yourself. Okay, never mind. Sorry about that. So let's get official because... Uh, what? Antarctica? Well, that was odd. I've always wanted to travel to Antarctica anyway. Well, we better move on. Catalysis is increased in the rate of chemical reaction due to the participation of an additional substance called a catalyst, like Pepsi. Oops, for a habit, I just drink a lot of Pepsi, you know. With the catalyst, reactions occur faster and require less activation energy. Activation energy is the minimum energy needed to result in a chem chemical reaction. In the potential energy diagram on the right, we can see the difference between the amount of activation energy needed to perform a reaction with and without a catalyst. The catalyst requires less activation energy and therefore there's an increase in the reaction speed. And it's important to remember that catalysts always remain unchanged after a reaction, except for some physical erosion or damage as a result of high exposure to temperature or pH levels. This is called denaturation. But before we take a closer look, let's take a short ad break. The Prentice Hall Chemistry textbook, Connections to Our Changing World, has left a significant mark on human society. Its interactive activities and rhetorical questions have mesmerized chemistry students all around the world. However, the quad clique has realized that the long explanations and tiny pictures have caused severe deteriorations in the students' ability to learn. In fact, it has failed to alleviate student spirits after doing excruciating chem research all day. Remember kids, if a chemical is inhaled, remove victim to fresh air and keep at rest in a position comfortable for breathing. That's why we decided to work closely with Prentice Hall to introduce a new and redesigned chemistry textbook. We call it quote unquote, connecting to the real world. After surveying a group of high school students at Kupjuna High, we have concluded the lack of access to chemistry textbooks at school has caused many students' grades to drop by almost 1%. That's the difference between an A and a B. Therefore, we had designed the new textbook to be significantly lighter, so that students can study on the go. The huge pictures and minimal explanations allow students to take notes in only 5 minutes, compared to the 2 hours they used to spend on the whole textbook. But wait, there's more. Here at Quad Week, we value our customers' help more than their learning. In order to help students cope with stress, we've decided to include an inbuilt stress indicator that tracks your heartbeat when holding the book. Well, let's face the facts. If you're reading this textbook, you're probably already stressed out anyways. The best part is that the indicator only takes a second 54 seconds to process your heartbeat. Don't worry, your results are sent to our secure server in the undisclosed location in Kansas, where your heartbeat is processed by our professional doctors. Any baby money mo catch a tiger by the telephone if I will just hold the let it go. That sounds stressed, alright. 
buy your very own textbook today and learn about the real world before it's too late. We offer two different models. The sleek one is made care with carefully engineered, fresh Japanese youthful synthetic recyclable waterproof tree free paper, extruded from special polypropylene pellets. The second model we offer is thinner, and that's non synthetic paper that is not extruded from polypropylene pellets. Together, we can make chem great again. Visit the CHS Science website if you want to order your very own textbook today. Yes, yes, I won't forget how many times I have to tell you. Psst, Karen, you're live. Oh, oops. Welcome back, everyone. So, we've learned how enzymes like pepsin can act as catalysts to speed up a reaction by decreasing the amount of activation energy. But how does this actually happen? Introducing the lock and key model. Sir, would you like a lock and key? No, for the millionth time, it's not an actual lock and key. Yes, I have to actually pay this guy. Don't judge. Well, let's move on. Take a look at this enzyme, which has a specific pattern to it. All enzymes are special proteins that have a specific region and a unique pattern to which the substrate binds, and where a catalysis occurs. This is called the active site. No, not that type of active site. Do you even listen to me? Well, when a substrate binds to an enzyme's active site, the enzyme substrate complex is formed, as seen over here. However, recent studies have revealed that the lock and key model is not completely accurate. In fact, scientists call the new model an induced fit. As you can see, the enzyme's pattern slightly morphs its shape to accurately match the substrate pattern. The reactants become bound to its enzymes by weak chemical bonds. This bonding can weaken bonds within the reactants themselves, allowing the reaction to proceed more readily. Whoa! In fact, mixtures of various elements such as polonium and beryllium act as catalysts to speed up the chemical reactions in a bomb. But catalysts aren't the only factors that can affect the speed of a reaction. Often, the surface area of a solid reactant, the concentration pressure of a reaction, temperature, reactant state, and many more factors could lead to changes in the speed of both forward and reverse reactions, usually changing the equilibrium point in the process. What just happened? Why did the fire grow when the food in splint was put over the baby food jar? Ouch! Don't do that kids. Moving on, why were there brown bubbles when the yeast reacted with the hydrogen peroxide? Before we take a closer look, let's back up to the basics first. What is yeast? Yeast are single cell fungi often used to produce useful end products due to their unique ability to digest food for growing, especially sugars. It is most commonly used to alcoholically ferment food, such as bread by producing carbon dioxide and alcohol. However, yeast can also act as a catalyst to speed up the decomposition of substances, like hydrogen peroxide, as seen in this lab. The decomposition reaction of hydrogen peroxide is seen in the following reaction, where aqueous hydrogen peroxide breaks up into the liquid water and gaseous oxygen molecules over an excessively long period of time. I know, it's boring, right? Due to the slow, undetectable changes in its decomposition, we added yeast to catalyze the reaction and speed it up. Therefore, we see a violent exothermic chemical reaction with brown bubbles of oxygen gas and foam. Evidence of the exothermic reaction can also be observed through the heat radiating off the jar. Ah, uh, that's boring. 
As you can see in the potential energy graph above, the hydrogen peroxide decomposition would have taken much more energy than the catalyzed reaction with yeast, showing a decrease in activation energy during catalysis. Later to test for oxygen gas, we lit a wooden splint on fire and sit above the jar from which oxygen gas was escaping. And as you may have learned already, the addition of oxygen to fire causes a combustion reaction which increases the flame. Therefore, we were able to produce oxygen and test it out successfully. Yeah! yeah. This is the house. Yeah, but first let's check if that one's home. Shh, follow me. Great, no one's here. Where's the key? Check out the doormat. I left it there last night. Found it. Give it to me. It's time to try out this baby. Just give it to me. Here, this is how it's done. Aww. So little VJ's gonna teach me how to use Play-Doh now? Shut up. Wait, what? How? Ladies first. Get real, we are about to need some food. This is the induced fit. Didn't you learn anything about catalysts in the chemistry unit? The lock and key model isn't accurate anymore. Ugh, oh, I don't remember anything from chem except for that painful research. Wow, this is amazing! Dude, be quiet. Someone's gonna catch it. I call the computers! No, leave the PCs. Take them out of the But PCs are. Shh! Yeah, um, we're, going to... we're not gonna start this again. Hey, BJ! You low on shaving cream? See, I told you. Let's get out of here. Now you're probably wondering what caused the glass to abrade. However, there are a few key components that we must discuss before analyzing the experiment further. Let's start with the most basic component of the experiment, glass. Now glass is often associated with a product made from silica, but it's important to recognize that it is in fact a state of matter, just like a liquid or a gas. A solid is considered glassy or amorphous when the arrangement of molecules or atoms in a solid substance are random and disordered. I know, they aren't very classy. For example, here is a comparison between a solid such as quartz and glass. As you can see, the molecules in the glass structure are more disorganized and its structure is unpredictable compared to quartz. Believe it or not, humans have been using glass, especially that of obsidian or pumice, since as early as 75,000 BCE for various items ranging from weapons to utensils. The first glass industry, however, did not start until 1500 BCE in Egypt. Today, one of the most common uses for glass is in the production of mirrors. Although glass is a poor reflector, it serves as a good base for reflective metallic layers and can be molded very easily. Often, metals such as gold, silver, and mercury are used as reflective layers in a mirror. Imagine what would happen if the mirror was never invented. Would you ever be able to look at yourself and tell yourself how good you look? That reminds me, I need a haircut. May I do the honors, sir? Go ahead, BJ. 
Did you know that in fact, glass has proven to be so useful to us today that large glass companies like Corning suggest that we are in fact in a glass age right now. For this specific experiment, we use man-made synthetic glass which is made out of silica and other melted minerals. Now let's take a quick look at the etching cream that we applied to the glass. The etching cream was composed of hydrofluoric acid that reacted with the basic glass to produce a neutralization reaction. The chemical reaction that took place consists of silicon dioxide or glass combined with etching cream containing hydrofluoric acid to produce silicon tetrafluoride and water. VJ, what did I tell you about live haircuts? Take it easy. Sorry sir, I'll be more careful. You better be. Later, due to the instability of silicon tetrafluoride in the presence of water, the compound is readily hydrolyzed and reacts with the water. As seen in the chemical formula to the right, gelatinous silicic acid and hexafluorosilicic acid are produced. Even though hydrofluoric acid is often considered a weak acid due to its lack of ion disassociation in water, it is in fact a very dangerous chemical and must be handled carefully. Therefore, it is able to corrode the glass and allows us to etch the glass with various designs. Also, if you haven't noticed already, the etched portion of the mirror refracts or bends light due to the removal of small particles from the glass, making a rough, non-reflective surface. When light from the air enters a new substance such as broken glass, the ray of light bends according to the law of refraction, also known as Snell's Law. VJ, I don't need to be shaved today, alright? Sorry sir, would you like to see your hair? Show me. Better. It's better than last time. Have fun with chem research, good luck on your chem demos, and this is Quad Click signing off.